Uh, from the Mile High, uh, Link stands for Language Integrated Query. It was introduced uh, quite a while ago in .NET 3.5, which was like 2006, and uh, 3.5 used C Sharp 3. So it, it applies to all collections. Uh, at the time, they had uh, a, a notion of there was link to objects, which is what we're talking about, and there was also a link to SQL, which is more like Entity Framework. And those two pretty much still exist. We just call them different things and do them a little differently. There was also a link to XML, which I, I think might still be there, but I, I don't know anybody that used it a lot even then, and they certainly use it less now. So hey, I, I use it. Much about I like that. it. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should Great. be presenting it. Uh, but I haven't used it in 10 years, so uh, I didn't cover that at all. I'm just covering uh, link to collections, uh, link, link to objects. And I will touch on Entity Framework, but I want to be clear, we're not talking about any fra Entity Framework in this presentation. That's not our goal. We have enough to cover. I it also covers... You haven't touched right. Link to XML in a long time is because one day, all of a sudden, everyone decided that XML is no longer cool and everything needed to be JSON. That's, that's mostly why, yes. We just don't XML anymore. Which I think is funny. So but. There's, there's nothing wrong with Link to XML if you're working with XML. Uh, we have optional parallel processing with Plink, and that's parallel link, of course. Uh, and I'm not covering much of that today either, because, as I said, we have enough to cover. But uh, you shouldn't have any trouble picking that up as soon as you're, we're done with this presentation and you've spent a few minutes with the concepts. Uh, <clears throat> link is... I, it, it allows you to write more expressive and functional code. Uh, some people will say C -sharp, that it added functional programming to C -sharp, C -sharp, which uh, you may you may argue that it may or may not fit your qualification for that title, but th that's the idea behind it. And when I first learned this stuff, it was in a presentation at this user group given by Nate. And so uh, I'm going to cover it pretty much the same way he did because it was just so comprehensive. It works best when paired with other .NET 3.5 features, and so I'm going to cover those language features as well. We'll do that pretty early on here. So I have a few awesome quotes that I just couldn't resist. So the first is, they don't understand. We are programmers. For loops do not impress us. And when he said that, I laughed for about three days straight. And I, the context doesn't matter because for loops are, are a, a poor man's understanding of the link that we're going to cover here. Anytime you're doing a for loop, you probably can or should involve link. They, it's a simplified way of looking at what they can do for you. But don't let your thinking be limited to that. But you'll, you'll kind of see what I mean. Next, this is me. I tell people this all the time. Link will change the way you write code. It will. Next, in a presentation, a different presentation on these concepts, Mr. Holmberg turned to a Java guy who was criticizing all of these things with no merit at all, and he said, there's no need to lash out. I'm sure Java will have it in a couple of years. Just calm down. And the whole room erupted with laughter. I think he might have been the only Java guy there. And uh, this isn't really anybody's quote, but so it's like streams, right? Yes, it's like streams. If you've heard of Java streams, it's a little like that. Link came first. Link is better. But that's their version of it. And, of course, if they didn't want me to chew on the shoe, they wouldn't have made it so tasty. Now, re the related features that I mentioned that came out at the same time to kind of work together with it are anonymous types, the bar keyword, lambda expressions, you can see the list there, and we'll cover each one here. I'll just give you a second to digest that. They say that if you read your slides at the same time that your audience reads the slides, it disrupts their the reading. So, next. So I mentioned we're not going to really cover these in depth. We will mention them and kind of tell you what they are, but those are presentations unto themselves. So Entity Framework and, and, and EF Core are the modern day equivalents to Link to SQL that I mentioned. So I wanted to kind of, uh, for those of us who, such as myself, who don't have a computer science degree, uh, you may not understand some of the more uh, abstract concepts here. So I wanted to talk about what declarative versus imperative code means. Declarative code is not where you tell a computer how to do something. 
and then let it run your instructions. Declarative code is where you describe something that you want done, and then the system that you give it to will figure out how to do it. And my examples may not be great, but in, in a nutshell, I would say that SQL is declarative code. You kind of describe what you want, and then the database figures out how to get it. It knows how it's stored. It knows how to come up with an execution plan to get it in an efficient way most of the time. And, you know, you're, you're not really giving it step-by-step -step instructions. Imperative code is where you give it imperatives or instructions. And this example is more succinct because imperative code examples are really easy to find. Basically, all the programming we do in most languages is imperative code. You say, do this, then do that, do that, then do that. Occasionally, we have a branch, but it's still imperative. So, uh, Link allows us to do more declarative approaches to computation and, and uh, translation of our data. Procedural code is uh, is imperative code, and this is what we write in our C sharp from version one on through when Link was in, uh, introduced. And if you're not using Link, you're still using procedural code. It, it may be object oriented, uh, but it is imperative procedural code. Functional code is something like uh, Link adds, where functions are first class members of the language. So there are whole languages that are built from the ground up to be functional languages, such as Haskell, OCaml, and F-sharp, um, ML. But the extensions that Link brings don't make C-sharp nearly as functional as those languages are. Uh, you're still dealing with a procedural language with these kinds of functional extensions. But uh, if, you're, if you're to think of it as functions being a first-class uh, member of the language, then I think that'll you know, mostly get you mostly get you there as far as understanding what I'm talking about. So, uh, I don't know if I'll mention this as I go through, but I wanted to cover it in case anyone's not familiar. The term fluent code or fluent expression, uh, it, it became, it started to become popular as far as I noticed, somewhere around 2008, 2009 maybe. And it's pretty simple, it just means that we have these uh, uh, methods that return them methods of an object that kind of return their own object so that you can chain the method calls of that object together. Such as in the example here, this is a builder pattern, uh, usually looks like this, often looks like this, uh, and C Sharp contains, or uh, the .NET framework contains the string builder which looks just like this, so it should look familiar. Where we say new builder has a method perform operation 1, and it has a method called perform operation 2. So instead of saying final result equals new builder, Final result dot perform operation one, final result dot perform operation two. We can just call them dot method dot method dot method. So link allows us to work this way, and some of the other features such as uh, method extensions, or ex sorry extension methods, allow us to improve this even further. And so you'll see this uh, sort of flow in the examples that I'm doing here today. Uh, not just in the examples. This is what you'll see in the world primarily. So there are two forms of approaching link expressions. And the first is method syntax. <clears throat> to keep things simple, this is what all, all my examples and, and uh, slides are going to use. And uh, it, it allows me to just kind of present just the one topic that, at hand. And then query syntax is, uh, it, it's, it's an actual syntax that's built into C Sharp in, in addition to the C Sharp procedural language that is just for link. And we'll cover that in, at the end. <clears throat> so link is, I, I don't know about primarily, but uh, you might, for, for in large part, is responsible for allowing you to work with data. And data usually exists in some sort of collection or set of collections. So collections are important here. Uh, the, the collections that you'll work with are displayed right there. And I'll point out, I enumerable of type T is preferred. That is the basis uh, type that Link likes to work with. List is just as functional and adds some stuff, but there are some good reasons not to use it. You, you will use it sometimes, but we'll cover that. Uh, it's not really a choice between I enumerable and list. You will need to use one or the other and, and make the right choice. As far as arrays go, uh, arrays Pretty much, I have full support just like I enumerable, but really under the sheets, 
it'll convert those to an ienumerable as you go. And so it's usually best to start with ienumerable of t, but if you start with, if you wanted to declare a literal, uh, arrays are usually a little cleaner syntax to do that. You'll see a lot of that in my examples. iQueryable is a little like an ienumerable. It's primarily only used for databases. You, you can use it outside of databases, but you're going to see a lot of it in the database uh, code that you're dealing with if you run into, if you're working with the uh, entity framework that you have to core. So here are all the methods I'm going to cover, all of the link methods. And there are mostly equivalents for these in uh, query syntax. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, one of the questions that's inevitably going to come up is, should I use query syntax or should I use method syntax? And I'll, I'll address that in different capacities as we go, but for the most part, I'm going to say that if the, if the method is on this list, it may not be available in query syntax. That makes the decision easy. Not all of these things are uh, necessarily, uh, if they're available, maybe they're not necessarily intuitive. So you can, you can decide based on readability of your code. So extension methods I mentioned before, uh, this is actually where that guy said, uh, don't worry, they'll have it in Java in a few years, I'm sure. We were talking about extension methods. Uh, extension methods allow you to add a method to an object, no matter where it's written, or whether you own it, or whether you even have the source code. And it works without breaking encapsulation. And there are really, it's a really good tool to use because you can increase the uh, fluid expression of your of your code by adding methods that don't break that fluid expression. So you can continue your dot, 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 dot method, dot method. Uh, I have examples for how to do that, but here are the rules for doing it. You need a public static class. Pub well, it doesn't even have to be public, I guess, but <clears throat> generally it is, or it won't be accessible where you want it. Uh, public st a static class, a static method, and the first parameter of the method needs to have the this keyword for the parameter, and that is the type of object that that method will be glued onto. And so the reason they're static is because they don't break encapsulation. They don't have access to any of the instance data on those objects. So that makes it kind of easy to remember that you have to do that. So here's an example. Um, this just adds uh, two methods. Uh, one is going to be glued onto a string, and one is going to be glued onto an int. I don't know if you can see this or not. Uh, so this type right here is going to be every type that is uh, of that type will have this method on it. In any file that has a using that includes this guy's namespace. So the name of this class really doesn't matter as long as it's unique among your code. But the namespace will determine who has access to this, and this type will determine which objects have that method. Make sense? Great. So here are examples, but those seem pretty obvious. So just because result one is uh, going to receive a string, we take the a string, <coughs> excuse me, a string literal, and because the string literal is a string, it gets this method, and because this integer it literal is an integer, it gets this method. It's as clean as that. So this is kind of a weird slide, but. Uh, I, I already mentioned this. Use extension methods to improve the fluent syntax in your link ex expressions. So that's a preface for this slide where I say, uh, here, here is one way that I could write a query. And I'm getting ahead of myself here with this all. I realize that's well pointed out. But the important thing here is that I have this expression that looks for odd numbers. And instead of that, I can create an extension method that transforms it into this. And you can immediately see the difference in readability. Um, this method can also return uh, uh, a type other than int and can become chainable, like we were talking about before. So this is an example, isn't an example of the fluent syntax, but uh, it, an example of readability. So you can use that in your expressions and make them much more readable. So type inference is super important because these new language features that involve uh, types that whose, whose names are so long we can never type them and they change their dynamic and even anonymous, we'll talk about that. We have to let the compiler kind of know those things for us and trust it to do the type 
checks for us where we don't have to declare the types because we, we know that they match as long as the compiler tells us they match, but we, we could never type them out. So the compiler has to use type inference to make those determinations. Uh, when you have a type whose name you don't know, you have to have a way to declare, to declare variables that can hold it. So we're going to talk about those three concepts here. The first is, uh, uh, in the return types, it will infer the type based on the value. So in the Hello World example, this is a literal, and it knows that it's a string. So when I say var simple type, instead of typing string here, the var will know that this is a string type. Let's be clear right up front, var is not a variant, if you're familiar with Visual Basic. It is not the var keyword in many other languages either. It might equate to JavaScript, but that just complicates things. There's no hoisting, there's no scoping. It just is a placeholder for the type name. So uh, there is a concept where the your development tools or your peers will say, well, you should have said the explicit type name, such as int or string, instead of a var in this place. Uh, there are arguments to be made both ways. Generally, if your tool says change this from var to the explicit type or the explicit type to var, just go ahead and do it to get the hint out of the way. Uh, but there are times when it's more readable to violate that, and you'll just have to decide that. Generally, I, I make pretty much anything a bar except a really simple primitive such as an int or a string. And then I watch for those hints. Second here you can see uh, I have, uh, uh, I call a constructor for a generic type, but um, it can determine from this type parameter what the type parameter is for this. Not just the list part, but the string part. It can, uh, and this really is the part that type inference is going to do the most with. So uh, bear that in mind. And this is just an example of something we're going to see a lot of. This is how I'm going to declare sample data because it's easy to read and it's simpler to type than creating a new list or uh, other types of collections. But in all of these cases, I can use the var keyword to to declare the variable's type without knowing the type. I do know the type in these three examples, but that's not always the case with Lake. So the second place we can use type inference is in parameter types. So where I declare a generic method that takes a type parameter of t, and then one of its parameters is a t, all it really needs to know, in, as far as this is just built into generics, if it knows what the t is, then it knows what that t is, because they're going to match. But when I go to call it normally, I might have to specify the int, but using type inference, I don't have to specify the int because if I specify an inputs, which is an i enumerable of int, then it knows that t is int and that t is int. So two string all can take an int and I don't have to specify the t. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, anonymous objects. <clears throat> this is the first type of element that we're going to go over where we don't know the type that we're going to assign to a variable that holds it. Because an anonymous object is given members and data, and maybe even methods if you're getting tricky. We're not going to get into that because you generally just don't have to do that. So we're going to say that it just contains data members, but we declare it here. Oh, it's going to flip on here. We declare it here without giving it a type. We don't have a class that goes along with this. We've just declared it on the fly. And so the var keyword allows us to assign it to this variable without specifying a type. So a new, uh, or sorry, an anonymous object is declared as a literal with the new keyword, and then no type name as you might with other news. And then in your body specification, you just have type member value. So I call it type member value. Actually, this is incorrect, isn't it? Those are commas. I apologize. I'll need to fix that. These are commas. So uh, once those are in there, there's a term that I, I'm not using much in my presentation, but I need to be, and that is duct typing. So because anonymous objects don't have a class, you can't easily compare two of these object types together because where's the type information? Well, the type information is going to be determined at runtime, and it does that using duct typing. It's just going to say if all of the members on of one object are compatible with all of the members of the other object, 
then they are said to have the same type. They call it duck typing because, as some of you have figured out, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and, and acts like a duck, it must be a duck. We can treat it like a duck. Plus, ducks are awesome. In I enumerable of T, this type is you're going to be your go-to uh, collection for all link operations. Um, uh, that was kind of a short slide. I expected more than that, but I've, but I've mostly covered that anyway, so it's okay. Uh, the state machine generator is a bit of an advanced concept as far as the link goes, but I'm going to use it early on because I want to use it to demonstrate another concept, and that is uh, uh, deferred execution. I think that's my next slide. So in uh, the example here, we have a method called new sequence that returns an IE numerable of T. Now I could return a list which is compatible with IE numerable of int, and I could return an IE numerable of int, or I could return an array of int, and those would all be compatible types for my my return type. I might have to cast or coerce, but you know, generally they they have the right member types and they're all collections. So <clears throat> Uh, that's probably how you would approach this in the past, but with a state machine generator, I can do something special. Uh, this method is going to run, and it's going to start executing until it runs into a yield. And this yield return is going to spit this number out to the caller, and then this method is going to pause right here, and it will not resume until it's called for its next item. And so the next time they call the next sequence and get the next item, it's going to resume where it left off and it's going to go to this while loop. And then it's going to return the next yield return value and pause again. And it will do this continually until it hits the end of the method or I call a, a yield break, I think. Um, so uh, it's important to understand how IAMU Mobile works at this point. Uh, an I enumerable is going to be, uh, I think the interface just has one member, and it's get enumerator, or get enumerator, sorry. And the get enumerator is going to be the one that goes through all of the members. He has a current property and a move next method. The move next method is going to move it through the collection, and the current property at any given time is going to return the element at the current pointer. So wherever the pointer is, move next advances it, and current points to that location in the collection. We don't ever have to uh, traverse an IE enumerable this way because the for each loop can do that, link can do that. The language has me numerous mechanisms to abstract that from us, and uh, you you just don't really have to understand how that stuff works unless you're really implementing some low level implementation of an IE enumerable yourself, uh, and that that probably does happen. So, in our next example, I mentioned deferred execution. I'm going to have a, a function in my example, the very first thing here, just like the uh, previous slides. I have a yield return here that's going to spit out one value at a time in this IE enumerable of int and kind of show you how it works. Now, at this point, I'm going to deviate from my slides and actually show it to you in a debugger because you have to see how this works. Uh, I'm meant to have I have, I have three different ways to present this. I have my slides, and I have a Visual Studio project, and I have LinkPad, but I think I want to show it to you in LinkPad. LinkPad is not it is more of a scratch pad, and it's not easy to kind of put together big projects and organize and stuff with it, but it has a great ability to show you the objects that are being worked with in Link. Uh, uh, I don't know how to copy this text out. Maybe I will go to my Visual Studio. I hope that I have, yeah. Well, it's not the same as my example, but it, I believe it does the same thing. So I'm going to call this, and it's going to start on this breakpoint. There we go, and I would like to see if any of you can guess the order of these console write lines, because if you don't understand deferred execution, you'll probably get it wrong. 
So the first thing we're going to output is probably A, right? So it hits this console.write line, and uh, as soon as I hit F10, it's going to come up to item get or sorry get item names, and then it's going to it's got these two console write lines in there that have, that are one and two, so we'll know when it goes in and when it comes out, and then it's got a write line B. So without putting anyone on the spot, I would assume that if if you weren't familiar with the concept here, you would say that the output is going to be A one two B. So here we have our second breakpoint. So we know it hits that. But now if we look at the output, that is not A one two B. Right? So let's step through this more carefully and see what just happened. So we hit our first line there. Here's our first console write line. And we see that it went to the output as we expected. Now we're going to come in here. I'll step into the. Oops, step into the what? It didn't go there. It didn't come to this line of execution. That's deferred execution. What I did is I didn't say go into this method and execute these lines. Instead, I said assign to this variable this expression. And this expression, because this is an enumerable primarily, is not imperative. It's declarative. And so it's not going to execute that code. It's going to say, here is something that they want. Stick that something that they want in item names. And now I have it, and I'm carrying it around in my little item names backpack. And I can move on. Console.writeLineB. And there it is. That's the output that we got. So C, of course, now this is the interesting part, and I mentioned the difference between toList and IEnumerable. toList is going to take that stuff out of the backpack. It's going to actually invoke the item names method and start picking out items from the IEnumerable. And because toList does what toList does, it's going to pull them all out before it returns. But methods don't have to do that. They can get them one at a time. That's the nature of an IEnumerable. So when I call toList, it's not going to be able to create a list without having the data to put in it because toList does not support deferred execution in this way. So when I do this, now I hit that breakpoint. This is a very important concept to understand. If I call .toList, it invokes a deferred executable uh, object. So now I'm going to get my right line one and a whole bunch of these. I'll click here, right line two, and there they are in our output. And now my items name, item names list has five elements in it. So in order to get these five elements into my list, it had to pull them out of the item names. It will wait forever and never execute that get item names code until it is required to get those elements out of it. When I call dot two list, that's the moment. There are a few other uh, uh, methods like two list that will invoke that uh, that I enumerable. And I'll tell you what those are as we go. To list is one that you'll, you'll you'll need to remember. Okay, and the rest of this doesn't do anything special. I I'm I've written this show data method. You'll see that throughout my examples here, and you can pretty much just kind of ignore how it works, uh, and just know that it's going to take a collection and spit it to the console. So that's what this is. I put a tab in there so you can see that it's data, and then we're done. So. This is quite a concept. Are there any questions? I'd like to make sure everyone has a firm grip on this. Um, Bill, questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing in using this in a real life example, I'm picturing it in my head as you're ex explaining it, that this would be more like an object, you're instantiating the object, and then when you need that object, you'd call it whenever. But what would it look like in a real-world example for using um, that delayed execution? I mean, I'm assuming it would be really well, hard to read if somebody is calling that um, get items name before instantiating it. I'm not even sure if instantiating the word that you would use in that context. But by the time yeah. they call it, if it's separated from each other ways, then that would be hard to read. 
Yeah, I get your question. So I, I want to give you kind of three answers. Uh, the first is, how would it look in, in real life? N maybe not like this. There, there are times where you would write it just like this, but in, in a context where it makes more sense to do so, you would have better names. Uh, let's say, for example, my get item names was uh, get next Fibonacci number, or get Fibonacci numbers. So I, Fibonacci sequence goes on forever, right? And I don't have to have a trillion values. Maybe I just want three. Maybe I want 20. Maybe I want a trillion. That same function knows how to calculate them all, but I want to tell it how many of them I want. So I can actually go in, and instead of calling dot .to list, I, I would go in and call it with a little more purpose and say, get item names, uh, get a numerator, and then move next, and then move next, then move next. And I've got three items out of it. And this function will only return me three items. But it does it one at a time. And so you said instantiate, and I'm not sure that's the right term. The, the better term might be invoke because it actually calls the method, and it has nothing to do with an object. So let me, the, the second answer that I want to give you is, uh, let me refer back to one of my earlier slides where I'm describing that this is functional type of programming. And it's best to wrap your head around this by thinking of functions as first class members of the language. And so the reason that this doesn't make much sense to a C-sharp programmer is because get item names is a function, you call it, it executes that code, and spits out a value. But if you think of this more in terms of functional programming, get item names is a value. This is a function, and a function is a value, not a set of instructions. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, I get how it's working. I just, just a practical application that's kind of escaping me at the moment. Yeah. So the but third. The Fibonacci, the Fibonacci makes sense, though, that being able to call it when you can say, hey, I've got this, and I'm going to use it whenever I need it. And right. I can do it differently in different places. Which yeah. that sense. I like that. It's nice to know that this doesn't all have to be in memory at once, as I think is a big key. Um, yeah. If you link properly, then everything just kind of stems together without having to have anything all together. And I make a big point of that a little later on and kind of demonstrate it a little bit. Uh, I don't know if I demonstrate it a little bit, but I do have a, a couple of slides to make a point of that. It's important to understand. And, and that brings us to the third answer that I wanted to give you. How does this look in the real world? This stuff is really important to for us to have so that we can do the rest of link. And the rest of link might seem a little bit magic, but that's because this stuff is in place underneath. And you remember the fluent syntax that I showed in the earlier uh, uh, slide. The way that link allows you to tack on one operation after another, after another, after another, is made possible by doing this. And then it enables what Nate just pointed out, that it doesn't go and build this mountain of data as it goes. It can just kind of traverse it and only have the minimum necessary sets at any given time. And we'll cover that too. I see. That's helpful. Okay, cool. Any other questions on this? Great. Uh, if, if we're moving past somebody's question, just interrupt and bring me back to it. Okay. Um, Oh, and here, here I point out the dot .to list. Uh, avoid premature execution by watching out for those methods, including to list, that cause an execution or invocation of that function. It should always come last in your fluent chain of methods. Now, expression trees. So we mentioned that the, uh, the innumerable function that I was using to get items, whatever it was, was, uh, was a function. I might have mentioned that it's an expression. Now, if we make a more complicated set of functions or expressions, we can kind of build on them one branch at a time, creating an expression tree. And they all kind of still work the same way with deferred execution. We can say, I want to do this and then that and then that and then that. And it still doesn't execute any of them until it has to. And so these expression trees can even be modified after you started constructing them. Uh, I won't show you a whole lot of advanced stuff like that, but it's important to understand and I will mention it when I have better examples that this is what it's doing to the expression tree. Expression trees are something that you kind of know is going on under, underneath, but they're not very easy to see necessarily until you, until they're executed and you get your result back. But if you really need to see those, I'm told that OzCode does a great job of that and actually allows you to see some of those things. I could be wrong about that, but being one of our sponsors and being that it's really, really applicable to this, I want to bring that up. Okay, enter something. Uh, 
let's talk about the execution. This is actually kind of what Nate brought up and we ended up talking about along the way. Uh, I probably won't read through this because we just kind of talked about it, but the expression trees uh, are, are deferred from top to bottom until you run that invoking ex uh, method. Uh, number four was the biggest point here, and we've also covered that. The, the I enumerable of t has to have an underlying uh, function to provide it data. That data doesn't even all have to exist at once. Like we mentioned the uh, Fibonacci sequence, it's only ever going to have one element at a time. It doesn't need the rest. Uh, others, where they're actually based on a uh, database table or a list, they'll have to have that one copy because that's where their data comes from. It was already there, a whole copy of it. But link isn't going to make a second copy to work on. It's just going to uh, create uh, a, another I enumerable that traverses each element of the one that came before it. And they'll chain, just like the methods in our fluent expressions, until they come to the output, and then you'll get a whole set if that's what you ask for, or less, depending on what what the data looks like that you're asking for. But it'll never have more. It'll never have more copies of the data than it needs. Uh, anonymous methods. We've talked about how functional this is. Um, one of the first things you notice when you're using something like I, I have been doing Delphi for a number of years, and Delphi has anonymous methods, uh, but. They don't, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about why anonymous methods aren't my favorite thing. Uh, anonymous methods allow you to write a function in line. That's the simplest uh, definition I can give you. Instead of defining a function and then putting it in a method, you know, writing the function in a method so that it be, or in a class so that it becomes a method, pardon my study, you can declare these things in line as actual code and they'll be passed as a parameter to a, a, another function or you can stick them in a variable and then pass the variable as a parameter of type function. But functions have to have a signature, so this is how we declare them. And you can declare your own types of functions. I'm not even going to show you how to do that, but you just Google the delegate keyword, uh, C sharp delegates and you'll find what you're looking for. I almost never have to do that. There are some generic functions built into the framework that that's almost all you have to use. So there's a, a func of type t comma t result uh, let me explain how that works. That means that you're going to declare a function that takes one parameter of type t and returns one result of type t result. So in the example there, uh, the first parameter is int, so there's going to be one int parameter, and the, the, second par the second type parameter is bool, so the function result type will be bool. So here are the, the base prototypes that I was talking about. There are funks and there are actions. And the difference is that an action doesn't return a result. So an action with no type parameters is just a void function with no, no parameters. Action t takes one parameter. Action of t1, t2 takes two parameters, etc. And there are several of these. I think they go up to four, five, six parameters uh, if you need them. And the same thing with func. They go up to four, five, or six, and each one has a t result. So these are pre-declared for you. All you have to do is declare a function that matches one of those signatures and declare it of that type. So lambda expressions are the coolest. In Delphi, we have anonymous methods, but we don't have lambda expressions. And anonymous functions can be very verbose, and they just aren't necessary most of the time. Uh, in, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of places where you need to use an anonymous function, the anonymous function is so simple, all it does is return a value. And so for something like that, we can do something that looks more like lambda calculus. And uh, the actual symbols don't quite look like lambda calculus, but the, the format of it does. And so over on the left, you have these parameters, and they're in, in a set of parentheses. If you have one parameter, you can omit the parentheses, just to keep it even shorter. Then you have what's called the hat operator. Uh, there are other names for it. Uh, I don't care what you call it. I'm not... <laughs> My name's not better than your name because I said so. Uh, and then the third parameter is going to be the result. So we take a function that has no parameters and a body. We omit the curly braces for the body and make that hat operator. And then instead of return 3.14, we just say 3.14. Okay? And then be I'll, make well. a point to, I'll make a point to point out that if you read this out loud, you might say, Empty parameter list such that 3.14. Go ahead, Nate. 
you're using bar on all these, which is great, but it might be helpful to point out what the types are of each of these. Well, firstly, the types on all of these are inferred, which is why I use bar. So if, uh, if I return 3.14, you might think that the value is an int. Of, or sorry, a, a double of 3.14. I may be wrong, because remember that backpack concept that I'm talking about. This is a function. Anonymous or not, it's a function. And so we treat these functions as values. They're first-class citizens. And so starting with that first assignment operator, the equals sign, and followed by the parentheses, starting with those parentheses, we begin a function declaration. And so that function is going to be the actual type. It's going to be, uh, going back here, it's going to be that uh, first that first funk of t result, that's the type. So t result is going to be a double, and funk of t result, where t result is double, will be the return type that we assign to var get pi. So thanks for pointing that out, Nate. Uh, never forget that this is these are functional additions to C sharp. <clears throat> so it takes a bit to wrap your head around, maybe, but you don't have to have your head really. You, know, you, know, you don't have to have a concrete grip on these concepts necessarily to start working with link. If you have, uh, if you're working with a, a library, for example, that expects uh, a funk of this or a, an action of that, you can go a long way using those things without really even know what you, knowing what you're doing, as long as you kind of remember the syntax for providing the value that they're looking for. So uh, it's best to have a good understanding of it, but. You can you can go a long way with that, you know, as you kind of evolve your understanding of it. Uh, they can have a multi-line body too. This is sometimes useful. Uh, it's still shorter than anonymous method, and really you could get you could do an anonymous method without too much extra syntax here. But I tell you, I bet people still wouldn't be able to read it quite as easily and readily as they would a lambda expression because they just appear everywhere once you start using this. So they're really simple. You can just add the curly braces before and after the lines. But the one difference is going to be that you can no longer just say 3.14 as we do in this example. Now we have to say return 3.14 because this is no longer quite as shorthand. Once we've got those curly braces in there, it can't make the assumption that that one value is the return result because now it expects imperative code. So you'll use this sometimes, but generally not. Uh, let's see what I put in here under collections. Uh, I already talked about how you can declare your uh, uh, your literal arrays. Uh, this is just a bit of an extension on the type inference concept. You can see in the second line that I do a new with square braces and I don't tell it what the array element types are. I forget if that came around in 3.5 or not, but it, it wasn't always there. It appeared at some point, and so uh, that's really nice to do. There are times where it won't be able to infer that type, and it'll give you a compiler error, at which point you just have to specify the type as you do in the first example. So the third example is important too because you can see that I can create an ID enumerable of T using an assignment of a new array. And that's the convenient way that I've been doing it here in my examples. So in I enumerable T, this is what I meant to have up above. I don't know why that slide's kind of there, it might be that place. Uh, this is a more explicit example of how we do the, uh, how the enumerator works. And I'll just leave this here for reference. You can come back to it in the slide deck if you want to study later on. But we've mostly covered that. And list. Uh, I, I assume everybody knows what a list is. That's been around since .NET 2. And there, there shouldn't be any mystery to it. There's really nothing that I think they added to it that uh, is specific to link or .NET 3.5. Uh, if anyone can think of anything, just interrupt and speak up, but I think that's just as you probably understand it. Uh, I added dictionary. It's not spe specifically a link type, but there's pretty great integration for it, so I mentioned it. And really most of what I ever do with a dictionary is take one of these collections and convert it into a dictionary. And so I don't have much on this, just the one slide that kind of shows you how to do that. Now there's a there are a couple of overloads for this, but the one that I show here is the, the most uh, comprehensive, so and, it, and it's easy enough to show. So if I create a, a, a collection of numbers and I want to convert it to a dictionary, the first parameter here in the to-dictionary method, just it's, it's called a selector. That's what you'll see in the, in the uh, in IntelliSense. 
it's, it'll say it's asking for a selector and it expects a function. So the function is going to take a key parameter and that's going to be one of the elements in the collection. Each one will be passed in here in turn. And then the output will be key. So that's, that's really simple. That means that whatever that number is is going to be the key in the dictionary. And I could change that if I wanted to, but in this case I don't. The second parameter is also, uh, I think it's also called a selector, and that's going to be the value. So I have a function that tells me what the key will be and a function that will tell me what the value will be. There is an overload that doesn't require the value, it's just the key, and I think there's a third overload. You, you can look at them, but this one will do both. So that's the example that I think is most useful. Are there any questions on this? Cool. Helpers. Uh, there is a class called enumerable, and it's a static, I think it's a static class, but it has static methods. Uh, so yeah, it's a static class. And it can help us create some sequences. And sequences are basically a function that returns an I enumerable. And generally it'll be uh, constructed with the yield returns and the state machine because it won't return an entire collection, but it'll return one element at a time. And so, I enumerable, I'm sorry, enumerable.empty, it, it just gives you an empty collection. That's real easy. Enumerable.repeat is useful if you want to say, I want to start with this many elements, and I don't care what's in them. And there's an example there that's simple enough. Enumerable.range I find the most useful, and it, it's not the only place that I use it, but it's I think it's one of the cutest places you can use it, is in a for each. So back in the day, you might write, in, in, in C, you would write a, a for loop that looks like this. Later versions, what do I do like this? Int j equals zero while j is less than 100. Increment, increment j, and then you'd have a method body, and that j would be available. And so this is a traditional for loop, and it works this way because it, it very closely matches kind of the way that a CPU does tight looping. It has a counter register and it has uh, an accumulator and you can set that counter register to the number of iterations you want and then there are special instructions that will decrement that each time and this translates very closely to that. So this stuck around for a long time. In fact, C Sharp still supports it done this way. But of course C Sharp has the for each and everybody likes for each better. We have a third option now in link that I'll show you later. But Python, I found it interesting, does not have that classic for loop. In Python, you have to do your for loops this way. You have a range function that returns a sequence. And then you'll just for each the values in that range. So I so enumerable range will do that for you if you wanted to do it that way, just to give you an understanding of what it does. Uh, there are other uses for it, too. I use it to take, uh, if I have a collection of items and I want to number them, I can just take the count of those, generate a, an enumerable dot range of that many numbers, and then I can attach them side by side and create numbered elements. So I do that once in a while. Uh, default if empty is important, and it, it might be a little out of place too, but it's going to say if there's a, a collection with no elements in it, such as enumerable.empty, default if empty will take that element, or sorry, that collection, and insert one element, just one element, and its type will be the, the type of the collection itself. So if it was an int, it will, it will insert an int. And the value of that int will be the default value. So the, the concept of the default value for any given type is, has been in C-sharp since the beginning. And for objects, it's going to be null. For ints, it's going to be zero. For bool, it's going to be false. Uh, double, it's going to be zero, that kind of thing. Uh, this is going to be most useful when we start working with, with joins and things like that and some aggregate functions. And I'll show you why, what, where that's applicable. Uh, well, let's talk about comparisons. These are these are not new to .NET. Uh, they've been in since at least one. I'm sure they were in 1.0, but uh, there are a couple of different ways you can compare objects. So if the object is 
a primitive, like an int or, or a, even a string. A string is a reference type, but it'll compare those by value. They're a little bit special. Uh, most primitives will be compared by value, but objects will be compared by reference. So if you have two objects that are completely identical, but they came from two different new functions, new calls, they're not going to match if you compare them by reference, because they exist in two different places in memory, and that's what it's comparing. So a lot of the time, especially if you're dealing with database objects, it's useful to say, if this thing has the same ID as that thing, they must be identical, because they, are the, they represent the same row in a database. Uh, unless some of the values have changed, then you might want to compare by some of the values. If this is a user record, the user ID may be the same, but the name may have changed, so they're not identical. So we have hash codes, we have the equals method, and those are built into every object in .NET. We also have systems in there, that, such as sorts, which will require these comparison mechanisms to be implemented in a competent way so that they can do comparisons in a couple of different ways. The two ways that they'll do them is to compare the object uh, member by member or by, versus by reference. And the second is to create, construct a hash code for that object and then compare the hash codes. Comparing hash codes is nice because you can do kind of half a comparison at a time and another half a comparison at a time. And then you can do those comparisons just once but compare against 100 different objects. So. Uh, Let's talk about what those comparisons are. If, it impl if the object implements iEquitable, it gets an equals method. Well, the, the objects always have equals methods anyway, but this can be applied to uh, a, a more broad set of subjects. And uh, then these things are qualified to be passed to other sorts of operations. The iCompare is a little bit different. It's going to return an int. And so for sorts, for sort operations, you're going to want to know, is this less than the other or is it greater than the other? Or are they equal? A compare will do that. An iEquality comparer is useful for things like union and uh, uh, distinct, which we'll do and which we'll cover in a minute. But it deals with the hash code and the equals, but not the comparison. So it kind of does two of those at once, and that makes it suitable for most things outside of a sort. So if you're going to deal with collections, comparing to collections. You're going to make sure that you're going to want to make sure that the elements inside those collections, those types, have these mechanisms in place for comparison. Uh, get hash code is uh, this is I don't know why there's a separate slide for this either, but uh, in iEquitable there's a get hash code method and there's also a get hash code method on all of the objects. Same thing as uh, here for iEquitable. There's an equals on each object. So that probably should be two slides up. And then we just have an example of the equals. So in the link, let's start with the link methods. So I have examples of most of these. And I have some visual aids for some of the more complicated ones, but not the simple ones. <clears throat> Where is just going to take a collection of objects and filter the elements. And the output won't have the elements that are filtered out. Real simple. So it takes what's called a predicate and that means that it's going to take a function that accepts one of the items as input and it's going to return a boolean. That's what predicate means. It's going to return a boolean and uh, this is what it's going to look like you know, visualized. So on the left I have five records and two of them don't match the filter. They'll just be ignored and the three that match the filter will end up in the output. So let's check our link demos here. Skip some of these. That's okay. We're past them. Um, okay. So. You can mostly ignore this line, uh, but I'll, ex I'll explain it because I use it in every one of my uh, examples here. So I have this MF store data builder, and all it does is it creates an object representation of a sample database that I use for some things. And it contains, 
Uh, well, it contains four tables. I'm trying to think of how to visualize those. Probably just looking for it, I guess. So it contains uh, an orders and items, order items and payments collections. And they relate to each other just as you might expect them to in a database. So I have some add range methods here to add instances of those items. And there are relations between order items, which is a many to many between uh, payments and orders, I'm sorry, items and orders. And then payments is a many to one relationship of orders. So no surprises there. I'm just creating an instance of that in, in this line, and I stick it in data. So I'll just look over that. So there are my collections, items, order items, orders, payments. Okay, so I'll use those in, in different ways in these examples. So I have my first where here, and I say I want to get all of the orders where the order total is greater than 100. So if I look at orders, I have one with a total of 1, one with a total of 51, 111, 222, and 9. So I would expect to get these two back that are over 100. Bear in mind that what I just did there did not execute that where. That's deferred. And then when I do show data, it's going to actually execute that and pull the data out. Except that I've pressed the escape there. Okay. Um, sorry, that's the all orders, not the filtered ones. So there are the filtered ones. So we just got the ones we expected. That's what where does, real simple. Uh, if you were using JavaScript, this would be equivalent to a filter, uh, an array.filter. Okay. Next, we have select. And select is a method that does what's called a projection. And that's a fancy way for saying it's going to convert the value to something else. We're just converting it. Uh, we're going to take each element, which in the example here is i, and we're going to spit out a transformation. It doesn't even have to be based on i. I can say return 5. Then I'll get a 5 for each element. But if it's based on the element, of course, it's a transformation. Either way, they call this a projection. So in my select example, I say I'm going to get an item and I want to transform it to the item.name. So instead of getting the whole uh, item object, I just get the string in the name property. And this is the output. Pretty simple. Okay, and here's select visualized. You're going to get one, ele one element out for every element in, but it's going to be transformed in some way. Uh, select many is not to confuse with select. It's going to take a nested a nested collection or a collection of collections and it's going to flatten it. And this is usually used in conjunction with other things. Once you've trans transformed some collections in creative ways, you're going to end up with some interesting structures sometimes and select many will flatten them out at the end. And so here's an example of the code for that. I have a nested into array, I called select many, which flattened it, and then I can also call select at the end. So this is what it might look like. And I've tried to kind of demonstrate this as being an outer collection, and this, uh, sorry, this being a collection and this being an outer collection, and each of these being uh, a single element. And so when they're out, you'll get all of the elements from each of these will be in the corresponding output, but you'll only have one outer collection instead of a nested outer collection. First, last, and single are, I'm going to point out right now, these are invoking uh, methods. So they're like list of T. If you call these, you're, you're not going to be deferred anymore. It's going to start executing the the expectations of your expression tree. Uh, I'll cover each one here, but I have uh, I have a uh, code example that, that demonstrates most of these a little more thoroughly. So first is going to return the first element of a collection. 
second or last is going to return the last element of a collection, and single is going to return the first element of a collection, and it's going to expect it to be the only element of the collection. So if, if those expectations aren't met, the exceptions will happen. So let's go to the demos, and we'll look at first, last, single, first, single, last, fine. Let's have a look at the code. Can you guys see the code or should it be larger? I can see it. Okay. Now, the first item is, let's see, numbers list dot first. And so it gives us zero and that's, the, the collection is uh, uh, zero to nine on the enumerable. So the first element is zero. On the second one, we have a single item list, which I pull out a collection of just one, and I pull out the one, and so that's fine. In the numbers list, the last item is nine, that's as we expect. Uh, I think most of these are pretty obvious. Where it starts getting less obvious is when we get down to doing some invalid stuff. Uh, but before we go there, we have the or default variance. So there's a first or default, and if there's no element, it'll give a default. So same, same deal as we talked about before. If it's an object, the default will be null, and that's what it's going to return. If it's an int, it'll return a zero. And so for the first missing item in an int collection, we got a zero. A single missing item, we got a zero. Uh, last missing item, we got a zero. And that's because we added the or default to the end. So where we have a single with no elements, or a first with no elements, or a single with, or sorry, a last with no elements, we get exceptions. And this is the exception that you'll see. Uh, the exception is invalid. Uh, what is it? Invalid. Uh, I thought I had it in here. Uh, what's the exception? Nate? Invalid. Uh, I forget. It's I invalid. Say it's operation, but. <laughs> Sorry. I want to say invalid operation, but I guess I can find uh, out. It, it could be. Uh, if anyone cares, we can try it. But you'll get that exception, and it'll be uh, it'll have a message. Sequence contains uh, more than one element, or sequence contains no elements, or sequence contains more than one element, matching element. So you'll recognize there that it's an empty uh, uh, an empty an empty collection. Or if you do something like I'm doing here, where I want to do. Uh, uh, each one of these will take a, a, a function, uh, which is actually a predicate. So I can say, give me the first item that is where n is greater than 2. So it may not be an empty collection, but it will be a collection that doesn't have any matching elements, if that makes it's sense. It's an invalid operation exception. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Let's move on from that. I have a question, Phil. Yes. Go back, go back one slide. Yeah. And this is a dumb one. Um, where it says item dot single, um, i your hat i equals two. How would you actually read that? If you're chatting with somebody and talking about code, how would you read that to describe it? I would say a function where i such that i is equal to two. Okay, and i represents every row found in the query. I represents a single row found in the query. Sure, single and, row. Is. And it'll be called for every element in the in the in the items. Yeah. Okay. So, so. Perfect. That's help. That okay. helps things. Cool. Uh, skip and take. Uh, skip will, it, as we're traversing the uh, the collection, we mentioned that this is a, a forward only one time enumeration of a collection. So you go step by step over each item. If we want to go and get the third element, we can't just say, go to index 3 and pull the element out. Go to index 2, pull the element out. Go to index 9, pull the element out. Because they don't all exist at once. So we can still do it one at a time, but we'll, we have to do it in a forward fashion. So we can do a skip and say, in this items array, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to start at the beginning, and we're going to skip 1, skip 2. We land on 3. And this will return an enumerable of three, four, five. Make sense? So then we can kind of snip off the other end with take, and we'll say take two would give us one, two, and that would be the result. Or if we say skip two, take one, it would skip this one, skip that one, 
and take one, and our enumerable would just have a three. It's important so, to note that the skip and take are deferred. They Things are deferred. Like they return I enumerable, and you can continue your fluent expression beyond that. Okay? Now we're going to get serious. Group by. And I, I generally prefer to do group buys with the method syntax, but I wouldn't blame anybody to say, hey, you know, you should be using query syntax for this. It's so much more readable. It's, it's cleaner, and it's, it, it may be easier to write. You choose which way you want to go with it with, when you're talking about joins and grouping in a, in a query or in a link expression. Generally, if you're doing a group by, you probably are working with a database, but not always. If you're working with a database, um, you're 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 going to have you're going to want to use different joins or group buys than you do if you're working with data. I think, and I'll and I'll kind of explain why in a little bit. So, group by, I want to. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna copy the code out of this. and stick it into LinkPad because it's so good at visualizing this. Let's do that, I think. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can make this any bigger. Yes, I can. Good. When you do a group by in link, the structure probably isn't what you're expecting. It's going to be an I enumerable, just like everything else, but this is a nested type, so it gets a little bit creepy here. The first element in the I enumerable is this box right here. And the second one is this box right here. Each of those box boxes is an I grouping. An I grouping is itself an I enumerable, so it has a list of elements but it also has this key attached to it. And so it's going to go through each of these elements. It's going to calculate the key with this function, and then it's going to determine which of those boxes that element belongs in. So if the key is 1, it's going to stick it in this box. If the key is 0, it's going to stick it in this box. If the key is 2, it's going to stick it in the 2 box. Make sense? So when you do, if, if you want to do a group by in SQL, you're probably thinking of it in terms of a flat output. Link is going to give it to you in a structured output. So this is kind of in three dimensions. So you got to kind of remember that. And when you start working with the, the output for this, you're going to probably not do it the same way that you would in SQL. So when you're working with a database, you probably think in terms of SQL, and you might want to solve problems in terms of SQL. And that is not necessarily what you're going to get here. So it's important to understand those structures. And if any of you don't have LinkPad, uh, and you're having any trouble with these things, they have a free version. I recommend picking it up. And it is pretty functional out of the box. It just pretty much the only thing that it lacks that would be helpful for this is IntelliSense. So you might want to pair it with your Visual Studio to kind of overcome some of those things. But it's a great way to visualize your data. So let me go back to this. Um, here's a visualization of it. So these inner boxes are the I groupings, so you can kind of see I tried to mimic what's in the link pad, but link pad is better, I promise. It's uh, just going to get harder from here. Uh, joins, kind of the same story as far as whether you use query syntax or method syntax. I like it to write it this way, but method syntax makes this a really easy two-liner that's really easy to read. So uh, join is going to do pretty much just what you expect it to. This is going to be like an inner join for, for SQL. It's going to give you a collection of items that contain the element from the left collection on the left and the element from the right collection on the right only where there are matching records based on the keys. So you take a selector in the, uh, for the left and a selector for the right and those are your key selectors and that's what they're going to join on. If this name matches this first, then you have a match. So inner joins are easy enough. Uh, if there's a match on these records, it's going to take this on the left and this on the right and spit them out this way. Now, when I say spit them out this way, one thing you're going to recognize in here is that I'm doing an anonymous object. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can do this, and it's entirely up to you, but once you hit this function, 
you have to figure out how you want to return the data that you have. You have the left object and the right object, and then what are you going to return? So you might have a class that represents those, and you can use that. You can say new my class and then pass it in, in the pass members of U and E in the initializer. Uh, but this is a nice, easy way that you can just get them out and work with them in the next couple of lines of code. Uh, you might want to rename these, but if you don't have uh, if I want to say new user equals u, new uh, employee equals e, then it'll give those the proper names. But if I don't specify names, the names will just be u and e. So you can see that that's what I'm using in here uh, in my select u and e. Now, group join. Group join is aptly named for what it gives you, but not aptly named for what to use it for. You're going to use it to replace a left outer join. So. Uh, some folks are confused about the difference between a left outer join and a right outer join. They do the same thing, it just depends which table you specify first. We really only have the one option that I know of in link, and that's fine. You just, if you wanted a right outer join, you just transpose the collections that you're joining. Now, the one on the left is going to be the one that includes all of its records, and the one on the right is going to be null if there's no match, or the matching record if there's a matching record. And that presents a problem because if there's no matching record, this doesn't actually present you with a bunch of null columns for that record like SQL does. That's a flat output. Instead, you get this structured output. And you can't do much with those if you get an empty collection. So if we know that employees, uh, sorry, users is our left side. And if we group join on employees, we know that employees may have a match or may not have a match. All users are going to be included, but employees may be empty. And because we can have multiple matches, we don't get a single employee. We get a collection of employees. More structured data. So that complicates things even further because this E could be an empty collection. Remember what we said about empty collections? They can cause other functions to fail. So the first thing we probably want to do is flatten this out into a flat table like you're used to using. And that's where we use select many. Remember that we'll take a collection of U, which is a single user, and E, which is a, collect a collection of employees, and we'll flatten these into a pair of U, E, single objects. So like many will do that, but if E is an empty collection, it doesn't know what to do with it. So we have this magic default if empty. And that will give us an empty uh, enumerable with a single element. Sorry, I said empty, but it'll give us an enumerable with a single element in it of the default type. And when we're talking about these uh, coming out of a database, that's probably going to be an object. So you'll get a null. And then once that's flattened, we can do uh, an anonymous object to represent those two as a pair, and we'll get a flat table, just like we would from SQL. So this is more verbose, sorry, more verbose than SQL, uh, probably more difficult to read, but that's how you do an outer join in SQL. So there are these three elements you've got to remember. You do a group join, then you do a select many, and it needs to include the default if empty. Now, when you do this and you don't remember this at all, don't feel bad. I have to look it up about once a year. So here's how it would be visualized. If there's a match here, we get the pair. If there's no match, we get the single element on the, on the one side. And if there's... Uh, I, I might have these transposed, uh, and I might need to update this. Anyway, this represents kind of a, an empty collection, so there'd be a null object over here where there's no match on both sides. Now we have uh, these. These are what I call uh, collection-centric methods. We have intersect, accept, and union. So union probably should have come first because we all know what a union does in SQL, and that's pretty much what it does here. But uh, intersect will take... I wanted to do some Venn diagrams, but uh, my, my, I just didn't have the time to figure out how to do it with these tools and make it look nice. Uh, <clears throat> intersect will only return the elements that exist in common between two collections. And so as you can see in the example uh, from 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4, we get 2 and 3 are common between the two. So here's a visualization of that, and it's pretty straightforward. So that's kind of like a positive filter. Next is accept, which is kind of like a negative filter. And 
it's going to return every item in the, on the left unless it exists on the right. So in the Venn diagram of inclusion, it's going to look like Pac-Man. Okay. Then here's how it looks visualized. We'll have, I don't know why that's, um, that, that should probably just be missing. But if there's a match here, it's not going to be output. If there's a match here, it will be output. Since there's no match here, it'll be output. And then union. Union is probably not quite what you're expecting because it also does distinct. And that's important to remember. If I have duplicates I intentionally added to the example here, it's going to exclude, it's going to simplify those down to a single element. So where we have two blues here, we get a single blue. Where we have two reds here, we get a red, well, purple. We get a single purple. Where we have a single green, we get a single green. Where we have uh, matching yellows, we get a single yellow. Okay? Uh, cast I included just because I wanted to be wanted to include everything. I almost never use cast. I don't remember the last time I used cast. It's just not terribly useful most of the time. Uh, very seldom do I ever need to take an array of longs and convert it to an array of ints. And if you're not converting compatible, if you're not doing cast for compatible types, cast doesn't really work. You can't cast a string to an int. Uh, it just makes more sense to do a projection. If you just do a dot select, it does ex the same thing, exactly what you want, but you tell it what the transformation should be, and it, it just fills this role. So I, I don't use cast. Um, if, if, if I found a need for it, I'm not opposed to using it. I just have never really encountered a lot of that. Zip is something that I, I didn't even really discover until I've been using this for a year or two, and it's pretty useful. It'll just take the list on the left and the list on the right, stick them side by side, and glue them together. So it looks like this. We've got left on the uh, blue on the left, yellow on the right. We get a blue comma yellow as a pair. And this is a projection, so I can specify how I want this to look. But that's going to be the left input and the right input to my so, uh, projection function. Real simple, very useful. So if I wanted to take an enumerable dot range and create a list of numbers on the left and glue it to uh, a collection with the same number of elements, I can end up with a numbered output. Now let's get into some uh, aggregate functions. <clears throat> Uh, there are several, and they are a little bit, you, you kind of have to memorize which ones have this problem with uh, an empty input, but I, I think I got them all right in my, in my presentation here. I'll, I'll verbalize those and hopefully clarify those as I go. So any is very useful, and don't forget that a lot of these can take no parameters or can take uh, a lot of all of these link functions, may, may or may not take parameters. Like first doesn't have to take a parameter, but if it does, you can give it a filter or a predicate. Uh, any is the same way. You can say dot any uh, and empty parentheses, and it'll say, are there any records? If the count is greater than zero, it returns true. So any mean does just what it sounds like it does. <clears throat> I can also give it a uh, predicate as an example and say, are there any where the value is six? So that'll return, you know, go go through each of the uh, elements in the uh, in the input collection and determine if any of them return true. Now. I meant to point this out earlier, but elements like first, last, and single, uh, it's important to kind of think about how they work and, and bear, the, bear it in mind. If I use dot first, it's going to start at the beginning of the collection and it's going to run through it until it finds a match, and then it's going to stop traversing the collection. Because there's no reason for it to continue, it's already got its output. So if I do the same thing with uh, uh, single, it's not going to do that. It's going to go through the collection and it's going to note the first time it finds a match, but then to make sure there aren't any duplicates, it's got to go all the rest of the way through the collection. So some of these, if you have options to use this method or that method, it, it's important to remember that some of them are going to do less work than others. Dot any will stop when it finds a match because that will satisfy its output. All is going to be the opposite. It's going to have to go through the entire collection and it will return true if all of its predicate calls return true. Well, it can short circuit because if the first if one... It, it, yeah, if the, it, as soon as it, return, it hits a false, it can short circuit. But if it wants to return true, it has to go through the entire thing. So 
bear those in mind, but I don't know that there's a great alternative for all other than where and then count it's not a good thing. So uh, all can take no parameters or it can take a predicate, same as the, the one before. And these are going to return uh, true or false. And so can anybody think of what that means? Because they're not returning an I enumerable, these are invoking members, methods. So they're going to terminate, they're going to end your deferred execution and execute at that time. Make sense? Great. Uh, contains uh, does just what you think it does. It's going to iterate through a uh, uh, collection and just return true if it finds any matches of this type. It's not, can, it's not aware that returns the matches. It, sorry. It's not aware that returns the matches. It returns Boolean if it encounters them. So this is also an invoking member. Distinct does just what you think it does. It's going to remove any duplicates and return a single instance of each present element. So distinct is one that's probably the best example for, maybe not the best, but it's one of the good examples for why you need to have those comparison mechanisms in place. If you have a collection of objects uh, and they're being compared by reference, every one of them is going to be distinct because they all exist in a different place in memory. But if you're talking about uh, uh, database records where you have some duplicates by ID, they need to know how to compare by ID. So have your your get hash code overridden and your equals overridden and maybe implement some of those uh, comparison interfaces. Now, a, a list can has a sort method and you can sort it, uh, but order by and order and, and, and this next one are a little bit different because they're deferred. So you can specify uh, a comparison function, and you can th therefore you can tell it how what order the things are going to be in. Uh, but whatever the comparison is, it's going to be deferred, and so you can compare by multiple criteria. Instead of writing a comparison that says, I'm going to compare my, my person table by first name and last name and, uh, and age, for this order, and then I'm going to compare by person and, uh, sorry, first name and last name and age in a different order for, for this other order. I have to have a different comparison for every possible order. Instead, I can compare by one property, and then I can do it, I can do it in either order, ascending or descending, and then I can do it by a second criteria, with then by or then by descending. So, uh, let's take a look at the example there where I do an order by age, then by descending, by name. And so I don't have to have multiple comparisons just to specify my sort order. I can I can do the sort order as part of the sort instead of as part of the comparison. The comparison just has to compare objects and isn't doesn't even have to be applicable to this. Whereas a sort on the T list, you have to have a comparison to tell it how to do this. You can you chain the then buys? You can chain the then buys. You can chain the uh, I might have I don't. Uh, let me check my examples, because I might have done that, and I might not have them see. Uh, can you see it, or do I demo? Uh, no, I didn't, but we can... I can do that. It, it won't make much sense as far as what we see in the output. We won't, just because it's not a very contrived example. But I can I can do that. I can specify any number of criteria subsequently with my bytes. So, like I said, it doesn't necessarily show the third criteria in here because these are all the same date. I think it's calling date time now. So, uh, but but it does work. Okay, and those are these uh, these sort orders are in the middle of my <laughs> aggregates. Anyway, here are the rest of the aggregates. There's average, and it's going to calculate the mean. And there's sum, which will calculate the total. There's count, which don't confuse this with the count property of a T list. This is a deferred, uh, sorry, a, a, a non-deferred invoking method. So you have to put the parentheses. 
uh, on the on one of the on one of the supported collection types. And then aggregate is actually the name of this function, and it's it's comparable to a, a JavaScript reduce. And that's the most. Do I have an example of this? No, I, don't. I thought I had. Uh, oh, that is my example. I think I have working demos of each of these, but. Yeah, these are way out of order. I apologize. Okay, so I have a large number of orders and a number a number of orders and a number of large orders, and those are based on dot count. So remember what I said about the parentheses, and those will execute immediately. And then we have well, all, all of these will because they don't return I enumerables. So, uh, let's just go ahead and have a look at the output. Did I change this? I built a second ago. So the number of orders is a count, the number of large orders is a count, the largest order is a max, the smallest order is a min, the average is, you can see it returns a double, and that returns here, sum, and the aggregate. So the aggregate is the example we probably want to look at here. And it's, I've made it long and verbose for, hopefully, for comprehension. So in an aggregate, we have, I think, two parameters. The first is, it's called seed, but that's your initial value. So if, if I wanted to do, uh, I could write any one of these functions using the aggregate method. So I could rewrite max and I could rewrite min. There's just no need to because I've done. But if I were to rewrite the uh, max function, I would start with a seed of zero. And the second parameter is the, the accumulation function. And the accumulation function is, go, is just going to calculate a running value. That's an easy way to understand it. Uh, the terminology here is really the only hard part to understanding this. Seed and accumulator versus initial value and running function calculator. And then the last one is the results uh, selected. So in my functions here, my starting value actually is zero. And I take the running value and the element that I'm going to be, be passed in each, uh, each iteration of this from the actual collection. So we started with data.orders. So this current order is going to be one of those elements from that collection. Value so far would just be the initial seed plus whatever got spat out by this function plus whatever spat out by this function, plus whatever spat out by this function. Make sense? And so, well, it's go ahead. Plus spat out by the function, I, right? Because I'm, it's, it's not plus, it's whatever I say it is. Value, it's, right? Sorry, what? The previous return value from this function, what right? I, it's, let me clarify. Yes, you're right. Uh, what I'm saying is it's going to feed itself. And there's a name for that in uh, fractal, uh, physics, and I can't remember what they call it, but a function that feeds itself is what's going on here. And it has, uh, whatever output I tell it, it's going to become the next value so far in the next iteration of this. And current order is going to be the next element in the, in the collection. So it, it's going to take this, spit it out, and feed it into itself, spit it out and feed it into itself, until it runs out of orders to pass in. And then whatever was output last doesn't become value so far, it becomes the result instead. So in my example here, I just take the uh, the total paid and I apply a function or a, a filter and then a sum, which it doesn't matter what I'm doing with it. I just do some calculation and then I return the value, whatever it happens to be. I'm using some logic here. The reason that I use aggregate instead of min or max is because I need to apply this logic to each iteration. So whatever I spit out here becomes this this guy in the next iteration. Make sense? 
if this if this particular function doesn't make sense to you, that's probably okay. You may you may not use you probably find you won't use it that much. Um, I use it every once in a while. Uh, now there's one more concept that I wanted to point out here, and that is max and min are going to throw an exception if their their underlying collection is empty. But oh, so, and so will average. But some will not. Count, I think, will not. Right? So it's kind of strange that some do and some don't. But for those that, that do, you can very simply add a default if of the dot max or dot min, etc. And so it may not give you the result that you want. You need to be, be careful about that. But it will suppress any exceptions because it won't be an empty collection. So this makes sense on uh, maybe min. It might make sense on max. It does make sense on average because there, if there are no elements, the average should probably be zero. If the type though is an object, the average probably shouldn't be null. So you kind of have to you you have to make a conscious approach to that and decide what works best for it, and know that it can happen. Uh, if, if there's an empty collection, you need to deal with that. And I think that is all I have for aggregate, for all of the aggregate functions. Uh, there, I thought I had a slide on it. There's the, the exception. Invalid operation exception, sequence contains no elements, or sequ sequence has this problem or that problem. Okay. Oh, query syntax, great. So query syntax is much more readable uh, it's a little more verbose and probably not. Uh, if you want to just do a where and a select, it's it's a great go-to. If you want to do any of the more complicated stuff, it's a great go-to. If you want to do the middle stuff, like dot zip, I don't even know how you do some of that stuff in here. I'd have to Google it, and it's just not worth my time. I'll just call it method syntax. So use whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, this is the very simplest example, I think, and I I've been told and would would tell others this is an inverse. Uh, SQL. So instead of select from where, we have from where select. So it's not exactly backward, but it's the same concepts in a different order. So I'm going to say from and give it a variable name in collection. And that collection can be uh, an IE enumerable or it can be something out of Entity Framework. So if you're using Entity Framework, this would be a table. Uh, or a view or, you know, any, any of those other valid DB sets. Uh, where is going to be uh, your predicate, but it's not going to be written quite the same way. You're going to use this equals keyword rather than the double equal comparison operator. And so you'll have variable dot member, and you can do dot member dot member dot member if you're careful. Uh, I believe I believe that's incorrect. The equals part comes in when you're trying to do a join. I'm sorry, you're right. Thank you for catching that. Um, I've got my slides mixed up here. So, okay. So, yeah, you would use the double equals here in the where clause. Uh, and then select, you could just say select alias. If you do something else like alias.field2, it is technically a projection. But unlike uh, method syntax, you might think, well, if I don't want a projection, I just leave out the select. You can't do that here, uh, I, I, I don't think. You put the select in and tell it that you want the alias back, even if you don't want to do a projection. So once you start doing joins, and see, I, I told you I just got these all screwed up. I don't have the equals on here. So you'll want to use the actual equals keyword on the joins. But from table 1 and from table 2, where, and then projection. So the where is going to be like you're on. That's also correct what you have here. What you're well, missing is... me straight. Is, okay, yeah. So what you're missing is join. You, this is a yeah, kind of like left join. But the actual, if you can use the actual word join, yeah. then that's when you use the equals. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I've got, a, I've got them mixed up, but I don't have the join on here. Um, I have, I think I have an actual join on here, so why don't we just, I'd, I'd like to keep everybody's head straight. If I have them. Oh, this is probably method, uh, yeah, this is method syntax. Um... um Let's go through the slides, and then I have, just just for safety, I have an EF core project that we can actually do database stuff on if we want. So why don't we do that, and yeah, time permitting. 
So it, it would look a little like this. We, I, I should correct this, and maybe if we have time, I'll go and get that straightened out. Uh, subset queries, you can do uh, you can do some really cool stuff with this as far as querying a database. It, it's all still very readable, and it's a pretty nice way to go. So from this, and then it's, uh, I don't know if subset queries is the correct term, by the way. You, you look at an example, and that's, it does what it does. But you can do these sorts of things with uh, a query on the first and a query on the second, and they're just joined on uh, their relationship, which is defined in the DB setter and the objects. So it, it can infer that, and it knows what that relationship is, and that, that kind of does the join for you. And you can do queries or filters on each of those uh, sources, and then a projection at the end. So I, I don't know if I have an example of this. Oh, uh, I apologize, there's no example for this. Uh, using into would be when you use a grouping or, or a, a group. So in fact, why don't we... I, I think you should see an example of this. Oop, that one. With examples. This is what you came here for, right? To watch somebody else Google the thing. There we go. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so from, oh, it changed color. Okay, so from this table, group that field by that criteria into this name. And so std group is going to be the new name that you can query by. So you can order by that group name dot field descending, and then you can do a projection against that group. So into can be useful to simplify the thing as you go to make it more readable and easy, easier to process against later on once you've kind of established your inputs based on joins or, or complex table selections. Okay, let is going to be very simple. You just use it in a different place in a different way. So instead of grouping something into it, you can just say let this group equal this selection. And so uh, I I had a hard time coming up with contrived examples of this uh, to show where they're really useful, but when you need these, you really need these. So at least know that they're there, and go find examples of them when you know that you need to kind of uh, simplify or change the way you're doing your selections because the tables that you're selecting from become complex. And it, it may or may not be another good time to, to contemplate whether or not to use method syntax, but that's up to you. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other because, like I said, if I can't come up with an example of when it's useful, I'm not going to tell you what to do when you hit it. And then uh, querying databases, I've got just, just a couple of hints for it. And like I said, we're not going to cover these, but I thought these were important to just kind of slide in there. So the database systems that support Link that are provided by Microsoft, these really are ORMs, but their integration with Link makes them, you know, it pretty much killed any other kind of ORM as far as I'm concerned. And these are the only ones that people use. SQL Metal was the original link to SQL. The tool itself was called SQL Metal. You probably never heard it called that. Um, but if you do, that's what we're talking about. Um, Entity Framework, which I think is now at version 6 something, right? And EF Core, which is the current go-to. And it's, uh, uh, I, I forget which .NET Core version it came out in. I thought it was one, but it was pretty limited. And... It's full featured now, and it's still the current one in .NET 5. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the equals instead of the double equals for joins. Um, uh, when you run into these, you'll find that not all features are supported by every database provider. You can, for example, you can do different things against the SQL database than you can against an Oracle, and the link expression will work for the one and not for the other. Uh, and you'll get you'll get exception runtime exceptions. That, when you run into those things, and you'll probably just have to change the way you're doing your, your link expressions to make those things work. Uh, <clears throat> I point out that it's important to know if you're using lazy loading or not. If you're not using lazy, if you are using lazy loading, everything is easy. You just don't have to worry about anything. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't worry about anything. You can find that your code goes and does a thousand queries when it could do just one, and you'll have a performance problem. Your code will work 
It'll probably always work, but you'll have performance concerns based on the number of queries that it goes and runs. The queries themselves will be pretty optimal, probably, but you may end up with too many because it runs them as it needs them, and the code as a whole, the whole code base doesn't know what you're doing with your database. Only one expression at a time really knows what it's doing. So if, you're, if you are lazy loading, uh, you, you don't have to use these, but you can. If you're not lazy loading, you will need to use .include and .denInclude. And if we have time, I'll go and show those. I have some stuff for that, I think. Uh, but what they'll do is they'll tell Link which fields to bring back from relative uh, object trees. So if you have a foreign key from one table to another, it knows that there's a relationship there because it's defined in your date in your DB set, but it won't necessarily bring back all of the elements that are in that relationship because if it goes and does that and you have a tree-shaped database schema, you go and query a root object, it's going to bring back your entire database. That's a no-no. So you have to tell it which fields to bring back and you can apply filter to, filters to those things too to some degree. Uh, the ASNO tracking is important to understand because when you query in Entity Framework or, or EF, EF Core, you're going to have uh, you're going to get back an object that represents a record, and that record may be put may be modified and then put back into the database, and so it keeps track of where it came from, so that it knows where to put it. It keeps track of whether or not it's changed, and it keeps track of whether or not it was a new object or whether it came from the database in the first place. So it has a, a database context where it stores all of this stuff, and it keeps all of this from you. It's really nice. But if you know that you're going to query a record from the database and never modify it and put it back, you can use a performance trick that, uh, uh, on the uh, table that you're querying, which is to add the dot as no tracking method. And what that means is it's going to pull it out of the database, but it won't stick it into this tracking system that it uses to keep track of the objects that go back into the database. And that's a performance improvement. So if you're going to query a thousand records, that's a thousand records it doesn't have to keep track of. Um, so you, if you know that that's the case, you should always use as no tracking. If you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to not put it on there, but you probably know when you're doing that. Uh, those are three, three things that you'll probably learn pretty soon as soon as you start doing these things, but you, you won't want to learn a little bit later. You'll want to know right off. Uh, I was going to compare this to Java Streams. Now, let me preface this by saying I know nothing about Java Streams. I spent approximately three minutes looking this up. So if you disagree or if you know better, that's fine. I'm not going to go head to head on anybody that knows better. But as far as I can tell, Java Streams don't have any of these features on the right. I couldn't find anything in .NET Link that Streams did. Sorry, anything in Streams that, that Link didn't have. Not a thing. I found an article that listed a bunch of them, but the artist, the, the author didn't know what he was talking about, and they were all actually detriments to streams. So they do not have deferred execution. That's a big deal. Um, you, you, you really want to have that, that ability to kind of build and modify uh, the expressions that you want to throw at the database because it can optimize the query for that sort of thing. Same thing with the objects, really. Just not quite... A, such an intelligent way, probably. They don't have extension methods, and so you can't do dot my method or dot where i such that i dot my method, etc. You can't do any of those things, so they're not going to be as readable. It's not built into the objects, which means you. Uh, it says you have to enter first enter a string context. So instead of saying my collection dot where this dot select that, you have to say my collection dot stream dot where dot select. Not a big deal, but that lack of integration really limits where you can use these, and not even readability, but just limits where and how you can use them. And it, it seems to be pretty substantial. It doesn't have query syntax, so method syntax only. That doesn't mean it limits you, but there are going to be times when readability is sacrificed. And not uniform throughout the APIs, so Link is integrated really well from top to bottom all throughout c -sharp. Uh, the ienumerable type is available everywhere, uh, and wherever ienumerable is available, link is available. So, uh, and the uh, the stream systems didn't make it into Java until version eight, so it's pretty new to these guys. Uh, I'm sure they're glad to have it, but they they're they're lacking behind what link can do. 
the more I looked at streams, the more I appreciated Link. Okay, I think that might be my last slide. Yes, it is. So, uh, why don't I take a moment to ask first if there are any questions, and second, do we want to dive into any of those things that I've put off, such as querying the database or, um, or, or whatever you have in mind? I think it'd been interesting to see what a stream looked like. <laughs> oh, well, I don't have anything like that prepared, but yeah, let's have a look. They're easy to find. So it starts with that. So they've got a collection that's an array, and they have to go into this stream context. And now they have a stream of that type, and then they can get their their methods. So uh, they can also come at it this way, but they have to. They they can't just operate on a built-in type like I enumerable. They have to have it out, out in this own little world of its of its own. And they do have parallelism. I I should mention that. So that's good. But uh, once they have it, they have you know similar methods to what Link has. Uh, <clears throat> As long as it's built in, they can use it. Interesting. Makes sense? <clears throat> I actually think there's probably a lot more parallels with JavaScript than uh, Java. Uh, I, Yeah, there probably are. And I pointed out a few of them as we went. There's a parallel to filter, a parallel to map, which I didn't point out, and a parallel to reduce, which uh, reduce is much more useful in JavaScript than it is in .NET, I think. I use reduce all the time in JavaScript, but I very seldom, not very seldom, but not often use aggregate in .NET. Uh, maybe, maybe that's atypical, I don't know, but, but the parallels, I thought the same thing, are more, uh, more closely related to JavaScript than to Java. Okay, shall we wrap this up, Nate? Yeah, sounds good to me. Thanks so okay. much for coming. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Look forward Thank to seeing you. everyone next month. Sounds good. Thanks, Phil. See ya. <laughs>